This is the Parenting IQ podcast where our mission is to equip you during your child's academic years to bring learning to the daily little moments. I'm your host, Dr. Kelly Cagle, and I want to welcome you to season four, Little Moments, Big Impacts. Lifelong learners, today I have Dr. Rebecca Jackson here with me today. She is the Chief Programs Officer at Brain Balance, and she's also an author, which we're going to unpack a little bit today. But she is a celebrated expert in brain health and development. She's published research on improving attention, cognition, and well-being, and is the author of the new book, Back on Track. If you are watching on our YouTube channel, here's the cover, which we're going to be talking about today. Dr. Jackson is a frequent media guest expert appearing on CBS Mornings, NBC Nightly News, and is respected outlets in, in respected outlets, including the Mayo Clinic Press, Forbes, Psych Central, and Business Insider. She is a wealth of information, you guys. Dr. Rebecca, welcome today. Thanks for joining us. Thanks so much for having me, Kelly. So I'm super excited, you guys, because as I'm reading this book, I've legit hit pause on the audiobook that I'm listening to and have been in my car clapping, screaming at the top of my lungs because the research that you're sharing, Dr. Jackson, is right on point with the connection that you're making between COVID and the learning differences that took place in that season with child development. So before we get going on all of that unpacking, can you tell us a little bit about this book, your work as an author, as a researcher, and also brain balance, please. Sure. Oh my gosh, Kelly, there's so much to get into just from the start. But first and foremost, I have to say thank you for that response. Writing a book is so much work. And you go through Mm -hmm. these emotions of feeling like, oh my gosh, I'm feeling so good. And I'm so excited about this. And then you hit these moments of, is anybody going to care? Is this going to resonate? And so to hear, to hear your response that it, it connected with you enough that you were cheering and clapping out loud, just absolutely makes my day. And, and for me, because you wear those, that dual hat, right? Where you're a professional Mm -hmm. as well as a parent. And so you understand it on the professional level, but then you live it as a parent. And so that, right. that couldn't mean more to me. So thank you for that. Um, Absolutely. But who I am as a person. So first and foremost, I'm a mom. And so you get to hear a little bit about that in the book. Um, and I'm also somebody that just loves to learn. And when I learn something new, I get so excited about it that I just want to share with everybody else the information that was fascinating to me. So I've been really fortunate in my professional career, and I've landed with a company called Brain Balance, and we're a company that works with both kids and adults to strengthen and mature the brain. Our job is to make the brain more mature, which means networks and pathways in the brain are stronger, faster, and more efficient, which helps us to be more effective at everything we do. Pay attention longer, regulate our mood and emotions more effectively, walk out distractions, um, and In my work at Brain Balance, my husband and I owned three centers in the Southeast for a decade. And so we worked hands-on with the kids and families and adults to deliver the program and and see the changes. And then I got the opportunity to work on the home office side of things and head up our research. So I got to live it firsthand to see the Mm. struggles that the families were facing, that nothing's more powerful than hearing about the challenge in the child's voice for them to tell you what they're frustrated about and then for them to verbalize what's changed. Um, But then to turn that into the data and the science to really help us understand what is it that we're doing that's driving and optimizing development? What's, what are we seeing in kids? What's changing over the years? Because at the end of the day, as a parent, we just absolutely want what's best for our kids and there's nothing more stressful and you know, just tugging on your heartstrings than when you see your child struggling and you don't know what to do to help. So I'm driven 
by providing parents with understanding of why you're seeing what you're seeing. Some kids are more difficult to parent in some instances than others, and it's not that they're bad kids, but sometimes our expectations of our kids don't align with their development. And so understanding where their development truly is allows us to set expectations that kids can achieve and allows us to support them in what they need. But then it also gives us directional information. What can I do today to get the most of, out of my child's current abilities? And then big picture, what can I do over time to really optimize that growth and development? And I talk about kids, but the reality is this applies to all of us. We all have yep. brains. And so this information is, is pertinent to, to us at any age, whether you're in your 40s like I am <laughs> or, or younger or older. Yeah, for sure. And that's one of the pieces that I loved about your book is that you provide the science and then you apply it to real life. And then you say, hey, if your child is or isn't able to do X, Y, or Z, these could be reasons why. And my husband always tells me that I should have been a diagnostician back in my previous life because I'm always trying to diagnose people. But to me, there are always reasons why. And whether it's developmental delays or you had a, you know, you're grieving something, there are, there are always pieces that puzzle, like that put us together, that, that build, that make us who we are emotionally, physically, spiritually. There are so many moving parts to who we are. And in this book, I felt like I was getting some of those answers. First of all, I'm a boy mom. So my audience knows I've got three boys and my oldest is 12, Levi is 12. My middle one is seven, Titus. And then my baby Micah is five. And when I read your very first chapter was about coordination. And I was just, or I believe it was the first chapter. I, I don't even recall anymore because I've moved on, but about coordination. And I was like, wow, this is why, not just because I have three different kids who are unique, but also because they are different in the coordination, in that development piece, in their unique abilities. My oldest Levi, for those of my audience, people that are that follow me on Instagram, you guys know that he's my athlete. Everything comes super easy for him. He was jumping off the mantle at two years old. And so his, his strength, his coordination, his core, which we're going to talk about, was insane. Well, then my middle one, Titus, not interested. And so that really got my attention, which is why I reached out to him and said, hey, can you talk about this? I would love to chat with you. Friends, if you want to grab her book, highly recommend it. It's called Back on Track, a practical guide to help kids of all ages thrive. Dr. Rebecca Jackson. And this is who we're talking about uh, to today. So you guys grab that. But Dr. Rebecca, going, unpacking this development with coordination. Can you start, I'm going to give you a really big word audience here. Stay with me. Reticular activating system or RAS. And you always give science alert, science alert whenever you're doing your audio book. But this is a big word that really can make sense for parents when they understand it. Yeah. You're good. I can hear you now. Can you hear me? Okay. It was, it was, um, it froze for a yeah, second. It was just cutting out some, let me, yeah, let me just see, make sure there's nothing running in the background. That's okay. Sorry. And we that. can edit this. You don't have to worry. Oops. We'll be okay. Okay. Perfect. Um, yes. Oh, I, I absolutely love talking about the reticular activating system or RAS. And to me, it's like you said, it's that understanding, you know, if you say to me, you know, gosh, drink more water, am I going to do it? Yes or no. But if you give me the why behind it, every cell mm -hmm. in our body needs water to function, your brain's going to function better. You're going to sleep better. Your immune system works better. When I know the why behind something, I'm so much more likely to remember the information and mm -hmm. then apply it. And, and so that was part of my goal with the whole book and having worked directly with parents for the last 15 years, 
you listen to the questions and the concerns. And so often parents come in asking the question of, is it because he's a 10 year old boy or is there something more going on? Are we seeing these behaviors because there's a lot of transition at home? Maybe it's a family going through a divorce or a change with teachers for the school year. Parents are always looking to understand the why. And we're all layers of an onion. There's so many different complications and factors that impact who we are. But for me, really looking at things through the lens of development can give us a starting point. And not everybody needs additional development help, but there's no downside to it. And so I just, I feel like it's a great place to start and it can help parents understand sometimes what they're seeing. So when we talk about the reticular activating system, I always picture it like this gating system in our brain. So when we're awake and alert during the day, our brain is taking in and processing so much sensory information. Just in our conversation right now, you and I are watching each other through the computer screen. We're listening to each other. I'm blocking out my dog and kids in the other room. I've got a candle burning. So there's a ton of sensory information that my brain's needing to process. And I use that information to answer your questions, to guide and direct my behaviors. But then when I go to sleep at night, None of that sensory information goes away, but my brain knows how to shut it off so my brain can slow down to a lower idle speed to go to sleep. And it's because of this gating system. So the very first thing that happens when we wake up in the morning is that alarm clock goes off and we start to stretch. And when we stretch, when we start to engage and fire core muscles, it starts to trigger to that reticular activating system to start raising the gate. And when that gate comes up, it's cueing our brain to start taking in more and more sensory information. So the difference between when we're asleep and awake, we've got the weight of the blankets, the sound in the room, the birds tweeting outside, none of that goes away. But when I stop engaging my core muscles, the gating system closes and my brain's not taking in that information. So that helps us to understand even the old adage that teachers used to say in the classroom, and maybe they still do, is sit up to pay attention. Mm -hmm. It's true. When we sit up, we're engaging our core postural muscles, and that's signaling our brain. It's telling our brain to be alert, pay attention, and take in information. So then when we sit back and think about our kids functioning throughout the day, or even think about yourself. Kelly, if you were to spend a Sunday vegged out on the couch all day, binge watching your favorite show, even though you've done nothing physical and active during the day, oftentimes you're going to feel really sluggish, sometimes even kind of grouchy and irritable. And it's because by not engaging those core muscles, when we're slouched on the couch, just vegged out for the day, we're not waking up and alerting and firing our brain. So we're going to be a little bit more sluggish. And you can probably think about instances where you've seen that in your own kids. Absolutely. I love one of the things that you, and I've already used it with my kids. I taught them and then I've used it. I said, engage the core or the body to engage the brain. So as you just mentioned, sometimes it's just a matter of you're slouched, you're not, you know, and the body just goes to sleep. What happens to the brain? That's what happens when we start reading a lot of times, right? You just are comfortable, you're curled up and you're just reading. Well, that's why you get sleepy because although you want to pay attention, your body is falling asleep, but you're, you're, you know, all of it starts falling asleep, starting, starts shutting down. So I love that. That in the book, I've, again, I've used it. I've taught my kids and I said, engage the body to engage the brain. So if they're getting cranky, I tell them, hey, let's engage the body. If they're falling as we homeschool too. So if they're starting to get disconnected, a lot of times we just get up and with the littles, I don't explain it as much. But with my older one, I tell them, hey, I learned something and it's really cool. And, and so I've, you know, it, that's just part of the learning process is yeah. engage the body. The way you can engage the brain. And that's something that's really applicable to for our kids in the classroom that we can tell them as you go today, hey, if you start disconnecting, ask the teacher, just go to the bathroom real quick. Just go take some deep breaths, walk outside. If you and if you can't, then just sit up, as you mentioned, and to to spark up the brain. So yeah. I loved that. And I wanted you guys to learn about that. 
Go ahead. Well, and I'll tell you, I always think about, you know, someday my kids are going to not live at home. And so I want my voice to be a broken record in their head of these little bits and pieces of information that they get to carry with them through life. And, and to me, these little nuggets of information can give you empowerment to know how to mm -hmm. impact your brain. And so with my kids, when it's homework time, from the time they were little, we would, we would say the same thing. We turn on our muscles to turn on our brain. And if they're, like you said, you know, doing homework and maybe they're starting to space out or, or get cranky or wiggly, they're older. So, um, right. You know, it, it, you, you direct them different at different ages, but it's, Hey, go, go take a movement break, go use your muscles to turn back on your brain because it does help us re-engage with our attention and focus. And I use it for myself throughout the workday. If I'm stuck on something and I've just, you know, hit that brain block, something as simple as getting up and walking to the mailbox to go check the mail, or I'll get up and do some lunge squats, you know, or jump squats, just something to engage my muscles, to accelerate the heart rate. Um, if I'm on a long call and I find myself zoning out, you know, same thing. Mm -hmm. I can sit up straight. I can, I can think about engaging my core while I'm sitting here. There's an opportunity always to engage your muscles. And that's something that our kids can do and control anytime if they know to do it. And so we can guide that for when they're young. So that hopefully that's the key word. If that. they know to do it, if they yeah. know to do it. And, and that's all, the work that I do all the time is to help parents, to equip parents that they can bring learning to these little moments. And this is so powerful because it doesn't matter if you homeschool, if you go to private school, wherever you go to school, this is an empowerment, a tool, a strategy that you can just put in your kid's pocket and they can use anywhere, even at, at church. You know, a lot of times you start yeah. yawning and whatever. Hey, just, just, just sit up and wake up. Okay, moving on to the next question. Talking about the core postural muscles. And you, again, in your book, you go into these different stages that I was replaying these flashbacks when my kids were babies and watching them crawl and watching the tummy time. And then I had one son who only crawled for five weeks before he started walking. And I was like, Ooh, could this have something to do with his core strength and things like that? So can you tell us about that core muscle and the importance of activating that please? Yeah. You know, it, it's so easy to minimize these things and think, you know, oh, it's just core muscles. It's not that important. But then when we really look at how the brain grows and develops, and it goes from this, you know, oh, they're just core muscles to, oh my gosh, that's the foundation for nearly everything. Yeah. So like you said, flashback to when your babies were little, when you picture an infant, one of the first things that they start to do is they start to lift their head and an infant's head is ginormous relative right. to their body uh, when they're little. And so to, to be able to start to develop that head control takes those core postural muscles. So the muscles, you know, in our abdomen, our back, our neck, those are the muscles that, that start to kick in. And, and when we look at the brain grows and develops bottom up and forward, and then we get top down control. And in this back lower part of the brain, it, it develops from in out. So the very first part of the brain in this particular area that starts to develop gives us control over our core. So it allows our babies to lift up their head, to turn their head to the side and put it back down. So this is tummy time. When our infants are in tummy time, they're working this first stage of core postural muscle development, or when you're holding them and they're, they're, you know, looking and, and turning around then. So we need to have that first foundational core development. Then from there, it starts to move outward. So next thing we start to get coordination and development of the limbs. So babies are going to learn to coordinate the right side of the body and the left side of the body. But first you'll see where both parts are going to move together at the same time. So an infant doesn't start by waving. They start by moving and, and flapping, you know, both hands up and down mm -hmm. when they're excited. And then as that coordination and development and control continues, then they're able to do it with one hand so that they can wave with one hand rather than two. But again, when we think about the order and progression, first it's core, then it works outward to our limbs to start to coordinate our limbs. And then things start to be able to cross the midline. So then we can coordinate right arm and left leg together. So when we think about, you know, riding a bike or walking or running in that coordinated pattern. And one of the things that I see happen often is 
we look at what's in front of us. So, um, you know, maybe it's a child that that is struggling to learn how to ride the bike. And so as a parent, we jump to practicing what the struggle is. I look at a child who's struggling to learn to ride a bike to say, okay, let's back it all the way back up to the beginning. Yep. What's missing? When a child has the developmental milestones and readiness, learning to ride a bike happens pretty easily. But if we don't have all the pieces that go into that, it, it's going to be complex. So first we have core, then we start to coordinate the limbs, and then our body starts to coordinate more complex. And then we start to be able to coordinate more complex thoughts and emotions. So while it starts with the physical, the physical is the simple foundation that leads to the higher level functions that, that everybody wants for ourselves and our kids. We want that ability to pay attention for a long time or to put our thoughts together in a sensical fashion to write an essay. But if we're struggling with coordination of our body, that often results in coordination struggles with thoughts and cognition as well. So, you know, to again, to go back to core muscles, one of the things that I'll hear is a parent may come to me and say, you know, we, we took our child and they were evaluated and we were told that they have low muscle tone. That's a big deal. So if we have a child that has low core muscle tone, we're not going to jump to tutoring or not going to jump to learning to ride a bike. I want to go back and make sure each of those foundational developmental pieces are optimized before we move forward to the next thing. So if I've got a child and, and again, parents have come to me and say, say, my child can't cross the midline. I've been having them practice cross crawl marching and they just can't do it. I'll, the first thing I'll say is stop practicing that. <laughs> don't, don't do that. Yeah. We're going to yeah. go back to the beginning and strengthen the core muscles and then work forward from there. Oh, I think that's so important. And, you know, I work with parents when I, when I work with parents and kids are struggling in the classroom, a lot of times when it comes to learning, as you're saying it, there are a lot of different little pieces. So just because and we see it way too often. And again, we are in, in different fields. I'm in education, you're in the science, but a lot of doctors just, and even educators jump to the conclusion that it's ADHD and let's do medicine. Let's, you know, let's tackle this. Whenever you and I are here saying, Hey, that may, that may be a solution to this problem, but could there be other things that need to be tended to that need to be targeted prior to just jumping to this conclusion. And that's what I try to say very often whenever, as soon as a lot of parents come to me and say, hey, my kid's struggling. And typically it's little boys, a little boy struggling in class to sit still to focus and behavior issues. We're facing all these things and, you know, we're getting all these suggestions. Is it dyslexia? Is it this? Is it that? And even a simple, not a simple, but sensory, you brought it up. We are listening to each other. We're watching each other. We have our thoughts about what we're going to say next and we're listening, but we're also, our brains are going. We are hearing the noises, all the things that are pulling for our attention. You picture a child who is a little underdeveloped in any of those areas and you put them in an environment where there's never a break from you know, sensory, everything, all the time, everywhere. And then you expect them to succeed. And so just the encouragement of, and, and that's another piece that I loved about your book that you do talk quite a bit and quite often about brain balance and the work that you guys do at brain balance that, Hey, maybe this could be the solution to this problem, but how about we do other evaluations to see where we stand? It, it's so important to me, knowledge is power. And so when I've got a child that's struggling in the classroom, whether they're struggling to learn or struggling to make and keep friends or to feel good about themselves or their names being called out in class all day long, mm -hmm. there is a time and a place for a label and every parent needs to make the choices and decisions to support their child that resonates and works for them in that moment. I just want to make sure parents know the options out there. And far yes. too often, I feel like, you know, we're aware of medication, we're aware of therapy, both things are important and good and necessary, but mm -hmm. there's more there. So at Brain Balance, we do do a really comprehensive assessment to really understand 
you know, if I've got a 10 year old sitting in front of me, where is this 10 year old truly at in all these different aspects mm -hmm. of development? Mm -hmm. And what we often see is maybe this 10 year old is a 10 year old in their body and maybe their memory is functioning at closer to yep. a 12 year old, but they're sustained attention might be that mm -hmm. of a six-year-old, their emotional regulation, their complex coordination. So at Brain Balance, we're going to measure things like your coordinated eye movements, how you process auditory and visual information, your rhythm and timing. We measure all of these age-based functions and then other functions um, that aren't age-based to get a really comprehensive picture of development. And what we'll see is so many of the kids that are struggling there's a developmental gap. So I might have a 10 year old sitting in a fifth grade classroom that aspects of development might be on par with a second grader. So what would yeah. it look like if I put a seven year old yeah. in a fifth grade classroom and said, keep up, you know, a second grader, when they get frustrated and upset are more likely to cry, to be more vo yeah. vocal. By fifth grade, we're going to, you know, kids are going to internalize it. They're not going to cry in front of their peers. A second grader isn't going to have the same attention span. So they are going to need more prompts and reminders to stay on task. They're not going to do as well with following multi-step directions. So we're going to give directions different. We're going to motivate and interact and redirect a second grader very different than a fifth grader. But as a parent and a teacher and an educator, we just see the body. We see the child in front of us. We don't understand always all nuances of development. And with the kids that we work with over and over again, these things aren't always moving forward at the, at the exact same rate. So again, mm -hmm. we might have aspects that are at or above age appropriate paired with other developmental immaturities. And the larger that gap, the difference between mm -hmm. high and low, the more challenges we're going to see. It's going to be harder for that child to be consistent. And as a parent, that can be so frustrating and confusing where you're like, you did it yesterday. Yesterday, you stayed yeah, in class, yeah. you finished your homework and you turned it in. And now today... I've had to tell you three times to, to hang up your towel and to grab your lunch and none of it's yep. happened. And so it's not that our kids aren't capable. The question is, how hard do they need to work in order to make it happen? And if there's a developmental immaturity or a gap, they have to work harder to accomplish the same thing. So and, at Brain and Balance, you know, I, we, yeah, go ahead. Well, no, 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 go ahead, go ahead. I was going to say, so at Brain Balance, it's a full comprehensive program to support that. The book gives you so many great ideas. It's not a replacement for a full program, but it's a great place to start for parents to gather that understanding and learn what you can do on a daily basis to help. Yeah. What I, again, there are so many pieces that I loved about this book and I'll just keep talking about it the whole interview. But I think what's so important as you're talking and you're talking about the gaps and the development and putting a, a underdeveloped kid in a certain classroom and all these things. What happens when a child is in that environment and faces those struggles? That's where my work comes in of they stop loving to learn. And how heartbreaking is that? Because then things are really difficult for them. It's hard for them to focus. They can't understand the information and their emotions are all over the place. And the sensory is there's just overload happening in their mind. So all they want to do is just go back home and we don't blame them. And so that's what is important to me is whenever we go back to unpacking and understanding our child and the practical tips and suggestions that you make in the book with the science of the why behind these things and even programs like Brain Balance. You know, I was unfamiliar. With, I, I've seen it driving down the street. There's a, a center not too far from my home. I have I have a couple of friends who have sent their kids there and I heard great things, but I didn't know for myself until I was reading this book and I'm like, wow, this is actually phenomenal and even fantastic suggestion for me to give to parents, because again, if your child is struggling, there are reasons why. Let's find out the why. And, and so that, that's a great um, understanding of this, you know, of, of the child holistically. Yes, and to me, the research is, it's so exciting because it's so hopeful. And I, I was just doing a bunch of data analysis and, and work this week, looking at some updated data. And we're seeing over and over and over in our research from the perspective of parents, teachers, clinicians, 
in diagnostic measures, we're consistently seeing improvement in attention, in inhibitory control. And in all of that to me, I mean, what you just described of the child struggling in the classroom, all of that translates to a child's sense of self, what they feel Mm -hmm. they're capable of. And so to me, I mean, I want not, you don't need to be a straight A student to be happy and successful in life. That's right. But that ability to know I'm good, I'm capable, I can make and keep friends. Those are the things that I want for our kids. And so knowing that the brain is able to change and that we're seeing really consistent results. I say all the time, there's no silver bullet. There's no, you know, quick fix. Um, But one of the things that I love too about the Brain Balance program is it's not this ongoing indefinite program. There's a gap. (laughs) We're going to close that gap. Mm -hmm. And when we close the gap, our work is done. And so our average program duration is five months. Um, Some kids need more, some kids need less. Um, Adults, we typically start with three months, Um, but it's not just this ongoing where, you know, you know, if you're looking at tutoring or or other approaches, it might be years and years. We're Mm -hmm. here to close the gap. And then you live life with, with that. Then you graduate, you go on. Yeah, you do. You do. And we, we do a big graduation celebration. And, you know, I think it's interesting too, if we switch gears a little bit to think about the parents. So often when the parents come to us, they'll say, you know, gosh, I struggle with some of the same things, but you know, I get through it. Like they're always kind of trying to understand how big of a deal is this? How much of an impact is this having? And to me, it's not a matter of, is something broken? Is something wrong? The question is, is there opportunity or potential for more? Could things Mm -hmm. be better? And what would that look like for you? And, And it's interesting because we think of development as kids, but our development as a child impacts how we function today. And so you, even though- You talk about uh, an example in your book that, that yeah. talks about this. It was this dad that, and I forget the, the scientific term that you were using, but it was a sausage fingers. This dad that had this light bulb moment. It was a reflector in, um, it was you rub the palm of the hand and it was that reflector that should go away from infancy. And you were teaching this dad about that and you did it to him with a pen and his fingers reacted. And he's like, oh my gosh, I thought that I couldn't type because of my sausage fingers. But then you were like, here, look, there is a reason behind it. Even as an adult, he managed, but it went back to, hey, we can develop that, that those reflexes and then you can move on. Yeah. And oh my gosh, Kelly, you're exactly right in that. That was a, an infant child development piece that was impacting him as an adult. And I was mortified. I can't even tell you in the moment. I was so focused. He just asked a question and I was trying to get him to understand it. So I was like, oh, here, let me show you. So as you described, it's an infant reflex that all babies should be born with. It's called the Palmer grasp reflex. There you go. So it's when you touch a baby's hand, they automatically latch on. It, it's, you know, it feels like a sweet bonding thing, but what's happening is they have sensory input and then they have a motor response. So that's starting to build the parts of the brain that take in sensory information. And then the motor response is starting to build our muscles. But as our brain matures, we should get to a point where you can touch my hand and I can control how my hands move. So here, this gentleman as an adult reacted the way a six month old baby should. So I did the test on him and my jaw hit the ground because I just, I was caught up in the moment. I was trying to explain something and I have no poker face. And so he saw me (laughs) react and he was like, oh no, what does that mean? What's wrong? And I was like, well, let's take a step back. And I was like, okay, we're now talking about you. I didn't mean to assess you, but here we are. And, and So as I was describing this, his wife, by the way, was sitting next to him, dying, laughing. She's like (laughs) doubled over in hysterics and I'm like sweating. This was not the direction I meant for this conversation to go, (laughs) but it was such an aha moment with him that clearly stuck in my memory as well. And he said, I can't type. He said he, he, he would you know, two finger, finger peck. And he he had gotten pretty fast at that, but that's just, it's not very efficient. And so Mm -hmm. it was the sweetest thing. And so he did that part of the program with his son and they both got to celebrate their gains and improvements. And, and we tested him at the end and he had outgrown that infant reflex. Um, That's awesome. He was, he was a mechanic and was that as a hobby and, but it was, it was hard and frustrating for him. So when his hand dexterity improved, he got better 
at his hobby and, and got to do it yeah. and enjoy it so much more. So, so yes, our childhood development impacts our ability to pay attention today, our ability to regulate and modulate how we feel when we're frustrated and upset. And to me, I always go back to the hope is it doesn't, we don't have to feel stuck. And so if mm -hmm. you have areas of struggle or challenge, if there are gaps there, there's a possibility that those gaps can be closed to build a stronger, yeah. more resilient, more mature brain. And what I love too, is that, and you've said this before, or just a minute ago, it's a short time because when I'm reading the book or listening to you as I'm driving down the road, my, my head goes to, oh, the parent that thinks my child can just learn to ride a bike. And it's because I haven't spent enough time. And then the frustration kicks in and then the yelling starts and you can do this. You just need to keep working, catch the ball, watch the ball, you know, and all of these pieces that can really lead into that should be sweet childhood memories can lead into frustrations. And, and those parents that are just kind of in denial that maybe my child, my second one, for example, is different from my first one. And we are just now getting into the moment that Titus, the middle one has started sports too. And he's not like Levi. It takes him longer, but we also started him with basketball, which there's so much happening in basketball. You, I mean, you talk about coordination here. <laughs> there's so many moving parts. But Josh and I, my husband and I are sitting and looking at each other like, wow, the difference in children. And it's perfect that I'm reading this book at the same time that this life event is happening in our lives because I'm living this, that the development is different as well. Titus was older, uh, was later than Levi learning to tie his shoes. He was later, he was the one that crawled for only five weeks and then took off walking. He is my, my quieter. And even to process his words, it takes him a little longer in our household. We all be quiet so Titus can gather his thoughts whenever he's trying to share. But there are reasons. And, and it's been so beautiful. So thank you for your work, for putting your knowledge, your expertise, your research, your effort, blood, sweat, and tears, I am sure, into this book. Because you're helping parents like me to understand that, hey, beyond just my kids being different than one another, yes, they are. There are also pieces that are unique to each and I can value and also not be in denial, not just shove it under the rug, not explode. Josh and I can come together and work with them individually to, to help them flourish in the little yes. pieces that create them. And, oh, and that, that, that's exactly the goal, right? Where if Titus is, is never, you know, top athlete, that's totally fine. Not everybody needs to be an athlete and, and maybe he absolutely will be, but to look at, Again, coordination is an early mm -hmm. indicator of later higher level development. And so you have an opportunity right now to maximize things early on, which is just going to take, you know, if he's a good athlete, it's going to take it to the next level. Um, and, you know, it, the funny memories that stick with you years ago, I was doing an assessment and this particular, this was a 17 year old. He was recruited for a D1 basketball school. So he was getting ready to go full scholarship. He, he really struggled in school. And so um, actually the, the D1 program asked for him to be assessed at Brain Balance because they wanted to understand where he was wow. so they could put support pieces in place. And I said, well, that's so cool what about support pieces. Let's also work about changing things. So maybe he doesn't need the support pieces, but, but let's do both. And do you know, it was fascinating to me. This was a 17 year old. This kid was like, I don't know, six, six, just awesome, fun kid. Uh -huh. And do you know, this high, high, high level athlete couldn't do a cross crawl marching pattern. He struggled so much with marching wow. and I tested it. I rechecked it. I rechecked it because I was like, what? This is mind boggling. And as I was going over the results, I was meeting with both he and his mom and his mom was like, this makes no sense. He's such an athlete. And he turned to his mom mm -hmm. and he was like, mom, I couldn't do it. I, I tried and I tried and I tried and I couldn't do it. And so it doesn't mean he's not going to be athletic, but mm -hmm. can you imagine as much of an athlete as he is already, you change that. And that was going to take him to a whole nother level. And the cool thing is they, they did end up doing the program. 
not only did he continue to have, t- to have gains in athleticism, he had massive gains and changes in his reading. His reading That's fluency awesome. was really a struggle. And it wasn't that he wasn't bright. If he listened to the information, he could answer the questions just fine. As soon as the eyes were involved, he struggled. So he hated reading. It took him longer than it should. He struggled with the comprehension when he was reading because his eyes would jump and skip all over the page. And so by going back to foundational development, we took a D1 athlete, brought him to the next level and, and made a difference with his academics. So all of that to say, Titus is awesome. He's amazing. Awesome kid. And working on maximizing some foundational development pieces early on just continues to optimize the trajectory of what's in front for him. That's right. That's right. No, I love this. And this is really exciting. Thank you so much for teaching us. Before we go, I want to ask you if there's anything else you would like to add that I didn't ask, whether it's about coordination. I know you I feel like we should just have a second part of this conversation because you talk about attention, you talk about anxiety, you talk about sensory, you talk, there's just so much in this book, but about coordination in particular that you would like to share with our amazing lifelong learners. I would, you know, a parting wisdom of parents is being mindful of screen time. Screen time is such a huge part of all of our lives and it's not going to go away. We've got to learn to live with it. Um, and you know, there's so many great things with screen time and I, so I never want to vilify it. We want to yeah. you know, celebrate the, the good parts of it. But when we talk about the importance of coordination and core muscles, we build and activate our brain and utilize and energize our brain through movement. And mm. every minute that our kids are spending on a device, they're not spending movement. Screen time is not developing and maturing the brain. Movement and exercise does. And so we've got to find balance. And as parents, I never want guilt. It's not about what you did in the past. We all do what we need to do in the moment, Mm -hmm. (laughs) but it's about continuing to learn and apply that knowledge. And so, you know, every once in a while, I'll go to my kids and say, hey, I'm going to change the rules. I just learned something new. So we're going to apply that as we learn and grow together to figure out how to navigate this together. So being mindful for yourself, and for your kids of how much time is spent every day on devices and how much time is spent moving. When our kids are little before they're in school, they're naturally moving. It's because again, sensory play, sensory integration and motor movement are the two biggest drivers of the brain. So our young kids, their bodies are naturally seeking that out. And then we put them in school where we ask them to sit still and hold still for hours. So once our kids are in school age, They're not getting movement throughout the day. So if they're in school all day and then come home and are spending hours on their phone, on their device, we're not optimizing what we can for development. And one of the things that I say all the time is a tired brain is a negative brain. And if a child or an adult has just spent two hours scrolling TikTok or two hours, you know, going through social media or gaming, that's actually really fatiguing to our brain. We've not engaged our muscles, so we've closed that reticular activating system. And we processed a ton of information, which is fatiguing. There's a, a cost to those resources. So our kids, when we ask them to get off their devices, are often negative and crabby and push back yep. and melt down. It's not just because they don't want to stop. We have allowed their brains to become really fatigued and a tired brain can't control and regulate themselves. And so as parents, we want to teach our kids that we want to find balance and we want to um, model that for them to say, Mm -hmm. Hey, yeah, you can go have some screen time, but we're going to do movement before and after. And gosh, I'm seeing you're kind of tired right now. Here's what we're going to do to help re-energize and re-engage the brain. So you feel happier and have a, a better ability to control your mood and emotions. So my parting words of wisdom is because core muscles and coordination is so important, We want to be mindful that our kids at all ages, our teenagers, just as much as the little ones, need movement um, to help with their mood and energy and and attention and productivity. Um, So just really being mindful of finding that balance. That's amazing. This is why you and I are basically the same. So I love it. (laughs) I'll take it. I'll take it. Because no, I love what you just said about a lot of times Hey, I just learned something new. We're going to try something. That's not, that's what I do with my kids all the time. And that is why our motto is being lifelong learners because life is always teaching us something. 
And we were, we never know enough as long as we have an open mind and welcome people that just share their wisdom and expertise. We can apply and really help ourselves and our kids and our family and their future and impacting the whole world. So thank you so much, Dr. Rebecca Jackson. Again, guys, her book is back on track at drkellycagle.com. We're going to put in the show notes, include the title of the book, Dr. Rebecca. Thank you for spending some time with us, sharing your wisdom, your expertise, your blood, sweat, and tears that you put into this book. Really appreciate you and the work that you're doing. It was a pleasure. And I hope you enjoy those boys. You sound like you have just a wonderful family and thanks for the work you do in supporting parents. Yes, ma'am. I have so much fun with them. You're right. I really do. (laughs) Alrighty, lifelong learners. I hope that you feel more equipped today to bring learning to everyday moments. Thank you so much, Dr. Rebecca. Have a great day, everybody. See you next week.